Okay, welcome to the first recording for Evolution Unit. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through Chapter 22 briefly, and then 23, and then the next recording will be over Chapter 24. Um, so this first picture is illustrating one of the pieces of evidence for evolution. Uh, what we're seeing here is, I don't know if you can read it in figure 15.8, but it's very similar to one that's found in your textbook. Um, of a vestigial organ. Um, keep in mind what a vestigial organ is. Vestigial organ is a organ that has been reduced in structure um, and function over a period of time and now serves as basically no use whatsoever or very little use to the organism that still possesses this. So in this whale, as you can see, there's uh, some bones off the back half of the spine. Um, where the second set of limbs would be if this organism was a land-bound creature, uh, needing four limbs to, to be mobile. And instead, we have these reduced uh, pelvis and femur uh, that you see here, and we still see these in a couple different species that are found on this planet right now. So this would be an example of vestigial structure uh, where it has been reduced in size and serves no purpose today. Um, we see this with actually a couple different types of species um, with a back half limb that is reduced in a couple different boa constrictor species. There's uh, little legs that still hang off the uh, back half where the pelvic would be, uh, the pelvic area would be. Um, we see this with toenails that are found on the flipper ends of manatees and manatees need no toenails whatsoever, but their, their ancestral line would be something more like a hippo that would need a toenail to kind of protect the limbs. Another vestigial structure feature is uh, this picture right here where we have a blind salamander that's found in caves um, that are underneath the surface of the earth. And what we're seeing here, if you were to dissect this salamander, you would see a skull that would have eye sockets, right, mandible, all the other components that are essential for uh, this organism to survive. But instead of having any eye ball inside the eye socket, it's simply skin covering the eye because it is much more advantageous to have uh, skin protecting that area because an eye can get infected and when you're in an area where there's no light, uh, an eyeball serves no purpose to receive any information. So those that had more covering or smaller eyeball uh, served a better fitness level in this environment. And in turn, we now have salamanders, very similar to the ones that are found above ground, um, these without eyes, and the ones above ground, obviously, with eyes. So these are examples of vestigial structures. Uh, another piece of information that supports uh, evolutionary theory is this one, where it's um, the analysis of embryos and development. Remember, this all codes down to the genes. Uh, and if you remember any videos or your teacher talking about these controller genes, they're called Hox genes, H-O-X. Um, these genes are controller genes that flip switches and turn things on during development. Um, as you can see here in this picture, um, fish, first one reptile, bird, and then human um, show, share similar features in development because of similar genes that are there. Um, obviously, they end up looking very much different in the latter parts of even development and um, after birth. Obviously, they look way different. But the more similar they are for a longer period of time, uh, the more those Hox genes are shared um, and the other coding genes that are around it, uh, which you'll read about in the book, uh, Your Inner Fish. Uh, Dr. Schumann talks about some of these things like the sonic hedgehog gene, uh, which you'll, you'll read about, is one of these controller genes that codes for development, but what you see here is the gill slits, uh, and that's actually, um, as you learn more about anatomy, uh, they're more like a pharyngeal slit, I think I'm spelling it correctly, pharyngeal slit, which uh, develops into the pharynx. In our example, uh, pharynx is the uh, opening that is kind of the dividing highway before you get to the lungs or if you go down the esophagus to the stomach. So these slits here, as you can see in a human, are still present uh, in birds and reptiles and fish. And those areas will turn into various parts of the neck region. Uh, we also see in humans, as we continue to develop here, this is very young in this embryo uh, cycle here, but you'll see humans will have these mitten type things for the hands. 
where there's still skin between those uh, young areas. And then same thing with the feet. And you can actually see this, uh, this tail that comes off the back half of the spine obviously diminishes uh, in some species and stays present in others, right? So this is embryo development. Uh, another one that is important for you is homologous structures or homologous features. Uh, homologous structures are the idea that there's lots of different bones in the exact same order, but they have been modified because of environment and um, what becomes more beneficial for the organism at the current time. So here we're looking at human, dog, pig, sheep, and horse. All of them have the exact same bones in the exact same order, but they've been modified in one way or another over time. So this is homologous structures. Not to be confused with analogous structures. Analogous structures would be structures that serve similar function, um, but have much different backgrounds. An example would be a bat wing and a butterfly wing. A bat wing has got uh, bone and skin flesh uh, that enables them to fly, whereas a butterfly is more made out of chitin, uh, and there's no bones present whatsoever in that insect. So uh, the example here, you're seeing the scapula, which is the, I don't know if you want to call it the chicken wing thing in the back of your, on the, the back of you. So if you, if you pinch your shoulders uh, together, in the back, um, you'll see that scapula kind of pop out. And then you've got the next bone, which is the humerus, and then the ulna and radius, uh, the carpals and metacarpals, and then the phalanges are numbered with Roman numerals. So you can see a dog is actually walking on the fingers um, spread out at one of the first couple joints in the hand. The pig, um, more walking on the fingertips, and the sheep and the horse as well. Um, and we have actually found that sheep and horse still contain a lot of the same uh, genes that have been turned off that are found in human hands. So although it looks like they only have one finger that they're walking on, uh, those genes are still in there. So if they accidentally get flipped because of a mutation, there has been horses that have been born with these extra feet with fingers on them, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and they look very silly, obviously, because they don't look like a horse foot. But you can look those up. Uh, next pictures, we're talking about natural selection. So we need to understand what natural selection is. And natural selection is simply the difference in reproductive success. So we're talking about not only fitness, right, the ability to survive and reproduce, uh, but the amount of organisms that the organi that that organism we're talking about makes. So here we're looking at a long term uh, progression where we started off with a gray and a white and a dark gray, I guess, or a blackish color. And uh, these mutations that, that show up in the population will obviously increase variation as well as sexual recombination. And in turn, we see a, the unfavorable mutation is being selected again. So maybe this environment uh, the, the lighter color is not advantageous, the darker color is. Uh, we end up getting more reproduction and mutation occurring, so we get more shuffling of a gene. Uh, especially if it's a polygenic trait, you're going to get more variation in it. So we're going to start seeing selection towards one side or the other. So in this example, right, we're, we're starting with a curve that looks like this. And we're going to select for more of the, the darker color. So later on, the curve is going to be more of the darker color, so we're actually getting a shift. Remember, that is called directional selection. Directional selection. Here we're talking about another example of natural selection in a nutshell, right? We've got a crow like organism that is eating beetles. Uh, they enjoy the green beetles more, so if we look at this population over uh, a long period of time, we're going to end up seeing less and less of that allele that codes for the green, and more and more of the allele that codes for the orange. So you'll start seeing a shift in dynamics. Now, if for some reason the crows disappeared or their numbers disappeared, then, well, that selective force has been changed. And we're going to see a dynamic of the population that's going to be dramatically different than what it is showing in this example. <clears throat> All right, Hardy-Weinberg, Hardy-Weinberg theorem, and Hardy-Weinberg equation. Uh, remember, Hardy-Weinberg theorem is basically saying that if these five things are held in check, 
that there will be no uh, evolution, especially on the micro evolution scale. So micro evolution, we're just counting up and looking at the alleles. So the first one is no natural selection. Remember, we just talked about natural selection is a difference in reproductive success. So if we do see a difference in reproductive success between one individual and another, that's natural selection. And we, excuse me, will see the uh, population evolving. Random mating is the idea that uh, nobody is choosing whatsoever and who's mating with who. So the opposite of random mating would be something like selfing, where you basically uh, breed with yourself. You'd see something like this with a flower um, in breeding where you're just breeding with those that are similar in family, right? Which we see in very small populations like the cheetahs of Africa are basically doing an inbreeding process because their population has been whittled so far down because of poaching and environmental destruction. And then the last one is assortive mating, which we see all throughout the an animal kingdom. And assortive mating is where we're choosing those that are more like you. So the bigger males choose the bigger females or the more elaborate ones. Um, you end up also having that selective mating towards uh, more brightly colored males or larger males. And that's sexual selection, uh, which we'll talk about near the end here as well. Um, large population is also another one. So the violation of this would be a small population. Remember, there are two ways that we can cause a small population in a very short period of time. One of those is the bottleneck effect. And bottleneck is when you get a large group of individuals randomly destroyed and a small population survive because of some sort of uh, natural disaster. The other one would be the founder effect. And in the founder effect, you end up getting a small splinter population that fractures off from the main population as inhabited this new area. Uh, that would be an example of a small population, but it's going to be random. It's usually going to happen because of some sort of natural event, right? So some sort of hurricane or earthquake or uh, some sort of monsoon or something like that that divides a small group from the original population. Uh, but the big thing is with small populations, you end up getting this random fluctuation of alleles that follow, and we call that genetic drift. And there's no adaptation whatsoever to that. That is just a uh, unselective force of random fluctuation in alleles. Um, no net mutations is also a Hardy-Weinberg. Obviously, obviously, the opposite of no net mutations would be mutations. So when we say no net mutations, we mean that a mutation can show up in an organism, but if they cannot pass it on to the next generation, well, then there's no net mutation in that scenario. Uh, if the mutation can be passed on, then we have a mutation that can influence the allele frequencies and the allele dynamics of the population. Uh, and the last one is no gene flow. Uh, so the opposite of no gene flow would be something like migration, uh, in the form of immigration or emigration, where we have new alleles coming in or leaving a population. That's going to change your P and Q frequencies. The math of this chapter uh, is with these two formulas, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Remember that P is going to be your big A, and Q is going to be your little A, so to speak. So when we're talking about P squared, we're talking about big A, big A. We're talking about 2PQ, we're going to talk about big A, little a, and we're talking about Q squared, we're going to be little a, little a. Um, and if you add all three of these genotypes together, you should get 100% of the population. So the allele frequency of P plus the allele frequency, or I'm sorry, yeah, the allele frequency of P plus the allele frequency of Q is going to give you 100% of the population as well. So when we're giving problems, like on the next slide here, we should be able to figure out what the P's and Q's are and how many individuals are carriers and whatnot of the population. So here's the first problem um, that I've put together, and you can uh, ask your teacher for some more problems if you need them. Uh, but here we have, if 235 out of 4,000 people in a population have sickle cell, uh, what percent are carriers? So AP is going to expect that you understand the stuff that we've learned in previous chapters about genetics and that 
Uh, sickle cell is a recessive disease. So we're talking about 235 individuals out of 4,000 are little a, little a, right? So if that's the case, and we divide that out, we're talking about a number that is 0 0.058, or 58% of the population is going to be little a, little a. Well, little a, little a is like saying q squared. So in order to get q, you got to take the square root of 0.58, and if we do that, we end up getting 0.24, or I'm sorry, 0 0.058. Um, we get 0.24, so q is going to be 0.24. Well, our other formula says p plus q equals 1, so p then has to be 1 minus 0.24, which is 0. Uh, why am I not doing math? 7, 6. I hope I did this right. Yep, so 0.76. So then if we're looking for the population that are carriers, remember carrier is 2PQ. So now what we're going to do is do 2 times 0.24 times 0.76, and that should give us our 2PQ. When we do that, we end up getting 0.36. Right, so 36% of the population is PQ. And if I ask for um, the number of individuals and not just the percentage, we could actually do 36 times the 4,000 that our population has. We can actually figure out how many individuals in this population should have it, and it's 1,459 people in the population should be carriers. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, other than that, I think the only things that we need to finish up discussing here would be the selective modes. So we've got three different selective modes if we see the population evolving. One is called stabilizing. One is directional, which I've already mentioned. And the last one is diversifying. Uh, in stabilizing selection, the original curve, right, we have these this range in this phenotype here. Um, we're going to be selecting for the center piece, right? So we're going to be looking around the median. So in turn, we're going to end up seeing that median increase in number. And we're going to see less on the two extremes. When we're talking about the number of individuals um, per phenotype, right? So example of this would be where the median phenotype is more beneficial. Uh, the example I used in class would be something along the lines of human birth weight. It's really not good to be really, really big as a baby, and it's not good to be really, really small as a baby. So in turn, the median birth weight is selected for. Uh, directional selection is when you end up having one of the phenotypes on one of the sides of the curve ends up getting selected for. So we're gonna start choosing here so this side of the graph is going to get more, and we're going to start decreasing on the other phenotypes. So you're going to see the graph moving one direction, right? And in this case, we're pushing to the right. But we don't have to be pushing to the right. You can push to the left as well. Uh, maybe it's more advantageous because the environment is getting harsh uh, to be a smaller individual because then you don't need as many resources. So in that case, you'd be pushing the graph to the left. Diversifying, the last one, uh, is when we don't select for one of the extreme phenotypes, you actually select for both of the extreme phenotypes, and the median is selected against. You just select on both sides here, so the end result graph, we end up getting a lot of one and a lot of the other, but not of the median. Uh, an example of this would be if you have a, a discrete character in the population, um, but you end up having, let's say, uh, an environment where there's black and white modeledness all over. Um, it might be advantageous to hide on the black spots or the white spots, but those that are grayish in color and intermediate between black and white would be selected against because they have nowhere to hide. Um, and this concludes our Chapter 22-23 discussion. Uh, look for in 24 speciation and speciation events, things like allopatric speciation, sympatric speciation, uh, what would cause speciation to happen, 
uh, and also why uh, it, it's important to understand things like clines or horseshoe species where we see a breakup in those populations.